Okay, so I am back. And in the last segment of the video, I told you guys that there were some laboratory values that I wanted you to highlight on your reference um, sheet. And I forgot to tell you, so let me tell you what they are right now. So, on your clinical reference guide, um, if you turn to page 488, the top says page 488, and I do need you to know at the bottom it says lipid panel. And it goes over cholesterol levels, um, HDL, LDLs, and also triglycerides. Please make sure you highlight the lipid panel. I will hold you responsible for those uh, values for the test. And also, uh, please make sure that you know the desirable amount. So I'm only holding you responsible for the desirable ranges. Um, I'm not so interested in high risk and borderline and all that, but just the desirable ranges and they do even break it down for males and females. Okay, so please make sure you go over the lipid panel. Um, the other thing I want to add to that is if you can go over also cardiac markers. So make sure you also highlight cardiac markers, which is on the next page, 489. So cardiac markers, um, creatine kinase, creatine kinase MD, and also troponin. Please make sure you know those normal ranges uh, for the test as well, okay, because I will have some case study type questions that will incorporate those laboratory values. That's the only thing that we're adding in, and those laboratory values are really for chapter um, 18. Okay, so those are really for chapter 18. <clears throat> so, the next chapter that we have to cover for week four is chapter 20. So again, let me just repeat, for week four, I am just going to cover chapter 18 and chapter 20. And as you can see with chapter 18, I tailored it down a little bit and I stopped at slide 37. Chapter 20, I will pretty much go through the whole chapter in its entirety, um, hopefully. And that will be the material that you'll be responsible for for week four. Okay, and then once I'm done with going over chapter 20, I'll do a quick review uh, to get you prepared for that um, exam. Okay, so with chapter 20, this chapter goes over shock. Okay, so what is shock? Uh, shock is not when you take your test and look at your score and get uh, scared. But what happens here with shock, <clears throat> shock is going to be a decrease in blood flow but mainly not only just blood flow, but oxygenated blood flow, that can also be considered now a life-threatening. This is a life-threatening situation where the body itself, and not only just organs, but just the body on the whole, can now go through a state of shock where it is all now being depleted of oxygenated blood. Okay. So shock represents um, a diverse group of threatening uh, conditions. Uh, the common factor amongst all types of shock, they say, is hypoperfusion. Hypoperfusion meaning that there is low blood flow going through the circulatory system. And it impairs the cellular oxygen utilization, which means that these cells are not receiving the oxygen in the blood that it needs. So when this happens, this can obviously decrease cardiac output. It can cause a maldistribution of blood flow and it can reduce blood oxygen content okay, in the body, which we all know that. Now, now with this table here, this is box 20-1, and it is in your book. Okay, I'm not sure what page it is, but just take a look in chapter 20, and you'll see the first box there, box 20-1. This box goes over the different types of shock, 
and also the uh, categories that fall under those different types of shock. So I would say please make sure you know this for test purposes. Make sure you know all the different types of shock and the categories that they do fall under. Okay, that is extremely important. And we will go over each and every category and we will go over in detail some of the different um, examples. Now, the first thing we have to talk about before we get into the different types of shock, we have to talk about the pathophysiology of shock. So the pathophysiology of shock is actually common um, amongst all types of shock. So the pathophysiology is the same. Um, it's just a matter of what happens or what causes the actual shock. But keep in mind that what happens at a cellular level is the same exact process across the board. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, what happens here is impaired tissue optimization, we do have, it results in cellular hypoxia. Now, when we don't have enough oxygen that gets to the cells, what can happen is it will go the anaerobic route of metabolism, which means that when the cell now tries to go into a state of metabolism, when we need the anaerobic route, or the, uh, the, ro the, excuse me, the aerobic route, Obviously, we know that leads to ATP, but if we go the anaerobic route, as you know, we do not get ATP in that situation. And when we don't go the anaerobic route, please understand that we do go the route of now building lactic acid. So what will happen is, if you want to jot this down, is that sometimes these patients will have a buildup of lactic acid in the blood, okay, just from this situation. The other thing here that happens is something called free radical production. So with free radical production, just to go over this, is what happens also due to the fact that we're going the anaerobic route and not getting ATP. And we know that ATP is needed for the um, channels and pumps that are on the cell membrane. So if we don't have ATP at that level of the membrane, what will happen is that these ions will just go crazy. And so what will happen is we don't have a consistent flow of ions or we get out of homeostasis. And then the other thing is that we do start to build what is called free radical production. Free radical production, what that means is that because we have these ions that are just going all over the place, and now the body will actually produce free radicals, which means that these free radicals are what we call unstable type of ions. So these unstable ions will now flow, through, flow, excuse me, flow freely through the body and then what will happen is that it can start to cause damage to the cells and tissues. Okay, so keep in mind that free radicals are unstable, and so when they do uh, flow through the bloodstream and when they accumulate, they can cause havoc. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that happens here is macrophage induction. So say, for example, we have these free radicals that are floating through the bloodstream, they're causing a whole bunch of damage, and so what will happen is that the body will recognize that, hey, something is going on here because of this free radical is just causing a lot of injury to the tissues. So macrophages will get induced and come to the site. Now, when macrophages come to the site, they're doing what they're supposed to do. But the problem here is that now we have all this congestion going on. And obviously, this will put this person in a state of having now even further hyperperfusion because of all the accumulation of macrophages. So just keep that in mind that this is pretty much the pathophysiology of this, and this is a whole cascade event that can occur, okay? And also failure of microcirculation can also lead to this situation of hypoperfusion as well. Okay. Now, when you look at this diagram here, and I know it looks crazy with all these arrows going every which way, um, but if you can try to follow it um, it just explains everything that I just went over as far as what happens with the anaerobic metabolism, no ATP, it inhibits the sodium potassium pump, the cells will swell, okay, causing cell death. It talks about how the free radicals cause the cell death, macrophages, here they go. So if you could try to follow this, it would be good, okay? So please make sure that you can at least try your best to decipher that um, diagram. Now, with shock, just to make this easier to understand and put it very simple, um, when a person goes into a state of shock, what happens is obviously, yes, there is low 
uh, perfusion of blood that is getting to the muscle tissue, okay, or the, I shouldn't say muscle tissue, but the organ itself. So what happens here is that the body recognizes that and the cardiac output drops. So when that occurs, we all know, and please understand that this is always a compensatory mechanism. When cardiac output is low, the sympathetic nervous system kicks in, increases the heart rate to pump, and get the cardiac output increased. So this is a situation that can happen across the board. This type of compensatory mechanism can happen across the board with any type of uh, cardiovascular issues where it gives a person low perfusion. Now, <clears throat> this just goes into just more information talking about what happens again with um, shock. And so we talked about lactic acid production, lack of ATP. So this is just saying the same thing over and over again. Now, one thing I just want to confirm with this particular slide is that they say that progressive stage of shock is marked by hypotension, okay? which is true. So what happens here, I do want you to know this, and this is a clinical finding, that in some instances of shock, patient will have a systolic blood pressure that is less than 90 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so please make sure you know that, that they will have a blood pressure that is less than 90 millimeters of mercury, okay, for hypotension. This box I'm not so concerned about. You don't have to worry about that. And so now let's get into the different stages of shock, okay? And some of these shocks are not that um, difficult, okay, to understand. So we should be able to get through this, okay? Now, cardiogenic shock, obviously this is a type of shock that involves the heart. Um, this is usually the type of shock that occurs after a person has it in mind. So if a person goes into a myocardial infarction, obviously because of the lack of blood flow, we know that it's not getting to the heart muscle, and as it starts to get depleted in tissues in just a larger area, this can lead a person into a state of cardiogenic shock. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, diagnostic features here, they can have a decreased cardiac output, elevated left ventricular end diastolic pressure, S3 heart sounds, which means S3 heart sound, if you don't remember, S1 and S2 are the normal heart sounds. S1 is love, S2 is dub, if you remember from physiology. And S3 is going to be an abnormal heart sound that's heard outside of S1 and S2. So usually when you hear an S3 heart sound, it is an extra beat that is heard and that is usually indicative of some sort of abnormality. And then the other thing that happens here is pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema can happen because what happens here is that these individuals will now, because of the whole fact that blood flow is not flowing properly through the circulatory system, they can now, um, because of circulation, have a buildup of fluid in the lungs. Okay? When they have this buildup of fluid in the lungs, you guys as nurses can definitely hear this during auscultation where they would now have what is called crackles in the lungs. So when they breathe in and out and you're listening to their lung fields, you'll hear this crackling type of appearance in the lung fields where you shouldn't. Now, this particular slide here just goes over what happens when the cardiac output is low. Okay, we talked about what happens there, reduce oxygen and so forth. So how do they treat this? The whole goal here is to increase the cardiac output, okay? Increase the cardiac output and decrease the workload. So therapy is aimed at improving cardiac output, obviously getting oxygen delivery to that heart muscle tissue and decreasing the workload. So some of the treatments that they can do here is definitely giving patients obviously some medications. Um, also any type of ballooning or stenting or any type of devices that can definitely open up the vessels get that blood flow getting to the area that it needs to. And in a situation, if it's needed, a patient will have a heart transplant. So this is another diagram here that is um, very good with showing you what happens with myocardial infarction and how it affects the um, cardiac output as well as the stroke volume and so forth. So I would say please go through this diagram just to get a full understanding if you need to. 
Now, hypovolemic shock, this is a type of shock um, where patients will lose um, a certain amount of blood volume, okay, blood volume or let's say blood fluids, okay, also in the body. So what happens with hypovolemic about the wrong thing. I'm, gonna, I'm, jump, I'm jumping the gun. Sorry. Okay. okay, obstructive shock. Sorry about that. Obstructive shock. So obstructive shock results from a mechanical um, obstruction that can prevent or prevent effective cardiac filling or stroke volume. So anything that's going to obstruct blood flow. Okay, so obviously common cause here would be a pulmonary embolism. The embolism can definitely cause that. Cardiac tympanin, uh, cardiac tympanin, just to let you know what that is, that is an accumulation of fluid around the pericardial space. Cardiac tympanin is accumulation of fluid around the pericardial space. And so if you have all this fluid around the pericardium, that will actually squeeze and put pressure on the heart, therefore causing contraction issues, and so that will cause a blood flow issue. And something called tension pneumothorax. We will go over this in detail with um, the uh, respiratory system. And the tension pneumothorax is actually when there is um, a piercing in the pleural space that will actually cause the pleural space to fill up with air. And when the pleural space fills up with air, this will actually push the heart to either one side or the other and cause a lot of pressure and strain on the heart. And obviously, if we put pressure on the heart, this will also cause alteration in flow. So that is that. Now, okay. and then the treatment here is just to take care of the underlying cause, whatever that may be, whichever one of these. Now, <clears throat> hypovolemic shock. Okay, so going back to what I said with hypovolemic shock, this is when individuals. Um, have fluid loss, okay, so whether we're talking about blood, um, body fluid, uh, such as water or whatever it may be, urine, okay. So this can result from inadequate circulation of blood volume precipitated by a hemorrhage, burn, dehydration, or leakage of, leakage of fluid in interstitial spaces. So it can come from a number of things. Now I do have some causes and different categories of losses, okay. So let's go over first internal losses. Okay, so these are internal losses. So if you want to jot down internal losses, I do have internal hemorrhaging, internal hemorrhaging, fracture from a long bone, fracture of a long bone, leakage of fluid into interstitial spaces, leakage of fluid into interstitial spaces, Okay. So those are the three that will fall under the category as internal losses. <coughs> Excuse me. External losses are going to be any type of external hemorrhage, burns, severe vomiting and diarrhea, and something called diuresis. D-I-U-R-E-S-I-S, -I -I -S, diuresis. And diuresis is a term that means increased urine production. So just to let you know, the external hemorrhage is actually the most common. Okay, so external hemorrhaging is the most common out of those external losses. Now, same situation here, cardiac output will drop, we know what happens, sympathetic nervous system increases the heart rate, get everything going, constricting, contracting, to get the blood pumping where it needs to. Okay, so we know that the compensatory mechanism will take place, which is what they're showing you again here in this diagram. Now, with hypovolemic shock, these individuals, say for example, we have someone that has a stab wound and they're bleeding, Okay, so this is a type of thing with extreme blood loss that these people can go into hypovolemic shock. Now, how would you treat them, and especially a patient that is going through an extreme hemorrhage? You would treat them, obviously, by giving them blood and definitely giving them any type of fluid replacement, okay? 
So usually these patients are put on an IV uh, fluids to definitely retain and get the fluids that they have lost. Um, and also if they need any type of blood products or anything that they have lost, colloids or crystalloids from urine or what have you. Now another thing that they do give these patients, I forgot to tell you, along with giving them a treatment of IV fluids, the other treatment they can give them is dopamine, dobutamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. So I repeat, the other drugs that they can give these individuals are dopamine, dobutamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. And so what these drugs do, they will actually increase the blood pressure and increase cardiac output, okay, which is what we need with this situation. Now this chart here goes over the different stages of hemorrhagic um, shock and the classifications as far as the different signs and symptoms these patients may have. Um, I'm going to say, yes, let's include this chart and make sure you go over this. Let's include, yes, the blood loss, okay, less than 750 uh, for classic, classic initial stage. Let's go over the compensated stage and go over progressive and the refractory stages. So make sure you go over all the clinical features for each of the stages. Okay, so let's add that in. Now, the next thing we have is something called distributive shock. So distributive shock, what does this mean? This means that this is characterized by excessive vasodilation, which causes a pooling of blood. So this is the issue here. With distributive shock, we do have different types of shock that fall under this category. But distributive shock just means that for some reason, the body goes through a process where there's an extreme dilation of the vessel. When there's an extreme dilation of the vessel, this means that there's not enough resistance for the blood to move forward. So what will happen is that the blood will just actually pull. When the blood pulls, this means that the blood is not moving the way it should, and so now tissues and cells are not going to be able to get the adequate amount of blood supply it needs. So this can also lead into a shock. So we do have different types. We have anaphylactic, neurogenic, and septic shock. Okay, so we'll go over each one. Now with anaphylactic shock, what happens here, I think we all know that this definitely comes from um, different allergic reactions to things. And in your book, um, I don't remember the exact, oh, I have the tape, okay. In, the, in your book, box 20-2, um, I don't know exactly what page it is, but box 20-2, there are some common triggers of anaphylaxis, and I do want you to go over that. Anaphylaxis, as you know, is the allergic reaction that people do um, have when they do come, come into contact with a particular allergen that they're allergic to. So on that box, it goes over things that people are allergic to, like strawberries, nuts, cat and dog hair, okay, shellfish, and different things. So please make sure you go over some of the common triggers so you can understand um, if we have a case study type question that involves one of those triggers. So what happens here is that when they go through this anaphylaxis, okay, the immune system goes through this whole inflammatory process where it will result in excessive mast cell degranulation and mediated by IgE antibodies. So what will happen is IgE antibodies will actually be secreted and released in this type of situation. So please make sure you know that IgE are a part of this. Mast cells do also release the vasodilator mediators resulting in severe hypotension. So what will happen here is that the vessel will go to an extreme dilation and then lead to a level of hypotension where these individuals will have a drop of blood pressure because the blood is just stagnant, it's not moving anywhere. Now with anaphylactic shock, okay, with these patients, they do have certain signs and symptoms that we want to go over. So the first one here, um, before we get into this, let me just tell you, um, these patients will have an onset of these signs and symptoms usually 2 to 30 minutes after exposure. 
So within two to 30 minutes after exposure to whatever antigen, so say for example, whatever type of uh, fish or shellfish that they're eating or whatever it is that they're allergic to, within two to 30 minutes, they will start to have these symptoms. So the first symptom here is called urticaria. Urticaria just means hives, okay? So it means that they will break out in hives. Another uh, symptom here is bronchoconstriction, which is something that we definitely don't want to happen with anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock because this is the thing that could cause these individuals obviously to go into a respiratory distress. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the next thing here is strider. Strider is noisy breathing. Okay, so that means that they just have noisy breathing, wheezing, and itching, itching that goes along with the hives. The other thing that happens here um, that's not listed in this PowerPoint, if you want to jot down, is that these patients can have an increase in heart rate, increase in respiratory rate. Okay, so increase in heart rate and increase in respiratory rate. The treatment here is definitely to whatever you have to do to open up the airway. Um, definitely epinephrine is used to um, kind of stop this vasodilation or to stop this sort of um, issue here with the anaphylaxis. Um, and as you know, the EpiPen is used, um, most commonly used in this situation. Antihistamines can also suppress this inflammatory response with vasopressors and making sure these patients have fluids um, to kind of help with the lack of volume that they're losing. <clears throat> the next thing here is neurogenic shock. This comes from the fact that the sympathetic activation is, is lost or impaired. And so now these individuals don't have that contraction of the smooth muscle of the uh, vessels. So this will cause it to dilate. Um, they say that this can happen from brain injuries, drug overdose, and if patients do have some neurological issues like spinal cord injury. So the treatment here is based on pressors, which will kind of help bring that constriction back um, and decrease that inflammation and fluids. Septic shock, um, this comes from the term that you've heard of sepsis. So sepsis, just to let you know, is a widespread systemic inflammatory condition. So you've ever heard the saying that if you want to get sick, go to a hospital, okay, this is what happens. So when you're in a hospital, we know that there's tons of germs and microbes and things. And so what happens when you have patients that are ill, and by them being ill and they're pretty immune compromised, okay, in some cases, they will be more susceptible for getting other bacterial infections and things that are just unfortunately floating around in the hospital. So sometimes when patients are very ill, they will start to develop sepsis because they just get this widespread systemic inflammation or inflammatory infection. So the most common cause here are gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria and fungal infections. Okay. So that's that. Um, the other thing here is that it is definitely um, a release, okay, of immune mediators, okay, which will give this widespread inflammation so everything gets activated. And these individuals will have that extreme vasodilation, which will lead them to hypotension, lack of blood flow, not getting to tissues. And the bad thing here is that because this is a systemic inflammation, this means that these individuals are not getting blood flow to not only just one organ, but several organs. And so these individuals could start to have pretty much uh, can lead to death or organ failure or, or different organ failure shutdown or lead to death. So this diagram here, I know it looks crazy, um, but it just kind of goes over the elderly, very young or chronically ill, you know, deficient people and how they can just get this sort of situation. Okay, so I would say go through that flow chart just so you can get an understanding. Now, one thing I forgot to tell you, septic shock is the most common cause of death in intensive care units. Okay, so they do say that septic shock is the most common cause of death in intensive care units. Um, the other thing is that the common, sorry, let me just go back to this. The common types of uh, microbes are E. coli, 
Klebsiella, Strep pneumonia, I'm sorry, Strep pneumonia, and Stat. So let me just repeat that. <clears throat> e. coli, Klebsiella, Strep, pneumonia, and Stat. So how do you treat shock? The therapy is just aimed <clears throat> with improving, obviously, the blood flow, but making sure we also manage that infection. So I remember watching a video about um, this doctor was saying how in the hospital they're trying to come up, or talking to the nurses about how to reduce the incidence of sepsis. And so it's pretty much by making sure the patients are uh, appropriately changed and tubings are changed making sure that the IV lines are changed and everything's clean and, and everything's just properly in order, okay, with the patients because when patients do go for long periods of time with certain tubing and things that are not changed um, in an orderly fashion, it can lead them to getting more bacterial infections and things like that. So taking care of ulcers and bed sores and things like that are very important. <clears throat> okay, so once they do that, managing, okay, the situation with antibiotics and treating the infection and giving them fluids and anything that's going to open up and increase blood flow. Now, this is where we're going to cut out some things, okay. So I'm cutting out the assessment and hemodynamic monitoring, so which is slide 26, 27, 28, 29, Okay, 26, 27, 28, 29, 26, 27, 28, 29, okay. So those slides we are omitting, and um, that information actually goes into more um, laboratory values, which don't actually match from the reference guide that I have. And this information, I'm not uh, so concerned about it because you guys will get it in nursing. Okay. Now. The last thing here I have to go over Okay, so the last thing I have to go over with chapter 20, okay, is um, just the complications of shock. So sometimes patients uh, that go through a state of shock, um, they will have some complications that can lead to obviously some other organ failures and things of that nature. So we're going to go over this right now. So ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. We will talk about this again when we get to respiratory system. Um, this is most commonly associated with septic shock.